following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. In our previous lecture, we began to discuss the purpose of these studies of Gnosticism, or Gnosis, which is precisely the necessity to come to know ourselves. And the self-knowledge that we seek to acquire is not theoretical or based in beliefs, but is instead something visceral and, and experiential, something we have to know from our own experience directly. In the same way that we experience anything in life, but the investigation that we, can, that we conduct into the nature of our self, or what we call the I, has to be approached in a very scientific manner. It cannot be approached effectively based on theories or mere dogma. Theory or, or mere belief always remains simply as that. A mere theory cannot change anything. We seek to know ourselves in order to seek a better life, in order to change our experience and become, become better people and to help others become better. We seek true knowledge. We seek to know reality in order to uncover the causes of suffering and to change those causes for causes that produce happiness, harmony, joy. And the root of all of those experiences is precisely within ourselves. Our happiness is not dependent upon external conditions. And any one of us can verify that when we may acquire some external condition that we long desired. We may experience a fleeting happiness, but it does not last. This essential, intransient, or impermanent fact is of key importance in our investigation into the nature of our I. We cannot put our faith and trust into something that is impermanent. Something that is impermanent will ultimately be no more. It is then unreliable and unpredictable, and thus is not something that we can depend upon. So from this approach, through a practical self-analysis, and by always being mindful of impermanence, we start to investigate the causes of our experiences. 
the causes of what we experience from moment to moment. And this investigation in Gnosis we call self-observation. This is a process within which we make our consciousness very active, very aware, introspective. In other words, we become hypersensitive of our own psyche. And without this activity, there's no way for us to arrive at any true knowledge of ourselves. In other words, what we require is the awakening of our consciousness. This is not something easy to do. Nor is it something that can be done overnight. And there is no magic pill and no shortcut. We awaken the consciousness through consistent, persistent effort from moment to moment. And this awakening occurs only by will, through applying our will, by applying this pressure to our consciousness to be active, to be watchful, to be cognizant. This cognizance begins here and now, watching ourselves constantly, always, without fail, without stopping. In the beginning, we always fail. We lose the continuity of our self-awareness. And so we have to start again and again, constantly watching, constantly trying to break through the veils that normally cloud our vision. In the last lecture, we discussed this series of veils, which are in Buddhism called skandhas. And the word skandhas means aggregates in English and can also be translated as heaps or collections. If you're familiar with mineralogy or earth science, you know that an aggregate is a collection of different materials like sand and gravel and rock of varying densities, weight and mass. And the ego is the same thing. These skandhas that we study also are a collection of many components which vary in their weight and mass and size and they vary in their power. But they're organized according to five veils or sheaths, five levels or relative um, degrees of density. And what we examined in the previous lecture was the way that these skandhas or aggregates are studied in the public level in most schools of Buddhism. And in this public level, the skandhas are presented in a psychological form as a way to begin to analyze our own psychological functions, the way our mind works, the way our consciousness works. This first level of study is essential And that's why the Buddha focused on it and taught it. And that's why the traditions of Buddhism continue to study and teach about the aggregates, the skandhas. To synthesize them, we start with the first skandha, which is form, which physically we would relate this to the physical body. And through form, we have our sensation, which is the second skanda. And we perceive sensations through the third skanda, perception. And our perceptions are in turn interpreted through the mental formations, the fourth skanda. But those mental formations have light, have energy, because within them is consciousness, the fifth skanda. So what you see then is a structure or an outline, a diagram of how the psyche functions in us. 
Each of these is called an aggregate because at each level, there are multiple aspects. There are many parts. And so these are synthesized. When we look deeper, when we look into our own experience from event to event in life, moment to moment, this technique or this tool of the skandhas becomes very useful. It it provides us with a way of applying a structured analysis to our experience. And by utilizing this structured analysis, It provides a guide to help us to penetrate towards the inner reality, the inner truth of any given experience. And this is the the very value of it that we need to grasp and put into practice. In the Gnostic tradition, we talk about self-observation as an activity of consciousness. But you have to understand that self-observation and self-remembering as an activity of consciousness does not mean that there is an absence of analysis. When you're in a state of self-observation or self-remembering, this state of active consciousness, you have the option of applying that consciousness in an analytical form even through the three brains, in order to penetrate into the nature of a given phenomenon. As an example, we can say that in the morning when we get ready for our day and we begin to get dressed, in that moment, we begin to make a selection from the available clothing. But why do we select what we select? Why do we choose what we choose to wear? If in that moment we were in a state of self-observation and self-remembering, we could apply that conscious awareness to the analysis of our decision making and look into our own psyche to determine what are the processes that are happening in that instant. Processes that happen very rapidly that are related to form, sensation, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. A beginner in these studies who's making the consistent effort to self-observe and self-remember, to be watchful, to be mindful, is likely to simply be making the activity, making the effort to watch what they do. And they may not have sufficient force in the consciousness to also analyze what they do. This is something that you have to get the flavor for yourself, something you develop yourself. Because it's very easy to begin an analysis of something and then get distracted into the intellect and go off wandering into theories. This is not the kind of analysis that we're describing. The analysis that is indicated or given in the the, um, skandhas is to look into that psychological process that we make in our example of selecting the clothes we'll wear that day. Why do we choose the ones we choose? When we look closely into our own psyche, there are processes that unfold. We interact with form. And in that interaction, sensation happens. And the perception of those sensations is interpreted by mental formations, samskaras. And within those is consciousness trapped. We remain completely unaware of all these things most of the time. But if we apply this analysis to the 
the event, we could say, what is it about this form that's producing sensation for me? What are the sensations that I'm experiencing? Why am I attracted to a particular form? Let's say it's an article of clothing. What is it about that particular bit of clothing, the form of it, that attracts me? And when we look, we'll find there's some sensation attracted that's attracting us, a sensation that we've experienced. And that sensation passed through our perception, a filter. And that perception was interpreted by a mental formation who's empowered by consciousness. So say, for example, we want to wear a particular shirt because we now have an association to that shirt because someone once praised us when we wore it. And it made us feel attractive. Because of that mental formation that we developed when we felt that praise and we felt our pride and vanity feel good, we want to repeat our perception of that sensation through that form. In other words, the consciousness that's trapped inside of that mental formation is being utilized by the mental formation to perceive once again the sensation produced by that form. And in turn, we mistakenly believe that that shirt gives us a sense of self. This is the very addiction of fashion. People become addicted to fashion, enslaved to fashion, because they believe it gives them a sense of self, a sense of identity or individuality or of being different. Many people idolize the idea that they can be a nonconformist, to be an individual, to be somehow different. And yet they don't recognize that in their seeking after individuality, they are imitating someone else. The one who wants to be a nonconformist is usually just conforming to a different idea. And in each case, they're trying to make more firm and more visible and more apparent a sense of I, a sense of self. Unfortunately, we've all discovered that any time we do this, that I or that sense of self doesn't last long and is always contradicted by something else. The latest fashion comes out, and suddenly, the fashion that we were so proud of yesterday is obsolete. And we feel fear, and worry, and anxiety that suddenly we're not following the trend. We're not keeping up. Someone might be laughing at us. Someone might be making fun of us. So we need to buy new clothes. And this is how people become enslaved to the constant need to shore up this sense of self that they find through fashion. The same thing happens in music, in television, in movies, in all forms of culture. Some people do this with cars. They need to have the coolest, latest car. Some people do it with jobs or careers or the company they work for. Some do it with their spouse, boyfriend or girlfriend. They only want to be with the, the coolest girl in the school or the, the, the most handsome guy in the neighborhood. And if somebody new comes along, they want the new one. In each of these cases, if this form of analysis is applied, we can discover in ourselves where our consciousness is most trapped. And this is why it's so important. As students of Gnosis who want to come to know the truth directly, 
The capacity to do that is in our very consciousness. But the consciousness cannot do that. It cannot see truth as long as it is trapped inside of a lie. The main thing we have to do is extract that consciousness from the lie. And then, naturally, the consciousness can see. So what we need to know in ourselves is where is our consciousness trapped? And every one of us is different. Some of us have our consciousness trapped in a sense of identity related with our background or our culture or our religion or our family or our musical choices or our fashion choices. And we build a a very strong sense of self in these cultural aspects, which are all related with personality. If we have the courage to begin to really analyze these parts of ourselves where we find the sense of self, we start to find out that they are impermanent. and They are unreliable. Many times, students arrive to these studies and they begin to study and practice the technique of self-observation and meditation. And they become terrified. They become terrified because we say that this I is not real that the sense of self we have is an illusion and that the ego must die. And when they begin to experience that this sense of self is a lie, is an illusion, many people, many people run away terrified. And they run and find some other school that makes them feel good about themselves, that supports their illusion of an I. And there are many schools that will do that for you. Of course, at a price. Gnostics, people who have actually acquired Gnosis, have reached that level of experience by conquering their fear. You really need to develop the quality of fearlessness in order to experience Gnosis. Fear is a huge obstacle. And fear is an eye. It is an ego. It's the great defender of the illusion that we ourselves have created. When we begin to really utilize this analytical tool of the skandhas and look deeper into our experiences from moment to moment, we start to see how these eyes work, how the egos in ourselves manipulate our consciousness in order to keep themselves alive. In the physical world, our perception of this is limited to our effort to self-observe. But even then, even with the most profound, persistent, and incredible efforts to be in the constant state of cognizance of oneself, you can only see so much because you can only see what's in the third dimension, limited by the senses that you have active here in the physical world. To really go to the root, to the depth, you need to learn how to meditate. It's through the process of meditation that you learn how to extract the consciousness from the skandhas. That freedom is called samadhi. Shine, ecstasy, mantea. This is an experience within which the consciousness is completely free from any obscuration. It is an experience that can be called nirvana because it is a perfect bliss. There are many forms of samadhi, many levels, but they all share a common characteristic, perfect mental clarity perfect perception, serenity, penetrative power. These skandhas, or five aspects, 
or levels of this uh, form of analysis have a direct correspondence in the initiatic Kabbalah. The skandhas are normally taught in Buddhism. But when we compare them and analyze their meaning and importance, we can see that those same levels and functions are described in the tree of life. But this is going into a deeper level. A level that's important. While we can use the skandhas in this surface level, physical level, through our self-observation and self-remembering, when you really get into the experience consciously of your own ego and how the ego functions, you likewise have to go beyond merely the physical level. Otherwise, you cannot understand how the mind works. And this is because what you can study physically is the physical matter and the manifestations that come from other forms of matter. But there are forms of matter you can't study directly from the physical world. As an example, in the physical world, we can study the form, rupa, ourselves, our physical body, or the physical form of any other element that we might encounter. We can study the sensations related to those forms. But it becomes difficult because those sensations are being filtered. We can also study our perceptions of those forms. But this becomes even more difficult because our perceptions are even more heavily filtered. And we can also study mental formations to an extent. But this becomes difficult. Because mental formations we see here as thoughts, feelings. We see the re result of those mental formations. We can't see the actual formation. In other words, we can see a shadow or, a, or an Im uh, impression of the energy of it, but we can't see its actual matter, what's producing that energy. And to see those things, we have to develop the capacity to extract the consciousness from form. Meaning the physical body. And in that way, we start to learn to extract the consciousness from each level until it's totally free and from that point of view it's able to see everything. When we relate this to the Kabbalah, we know that Malkut, the tenth sephra, is at the base of the tree of life. Malkut means kingdom. And Malkut is related with our physical body. Or in other words, the third dimension. When we study the third dimension, we study it here and now, in the physical body. And processing through the third dimension are all the energies and forces from the other worlds. You can see this for yourself right now. Where are your thoughts coming from? Where are your feelings coming from? Scientists have theories about this, but they cannot definitively say. Because again, in the physical plane, they can only measure the results of thought, not the thought itself. The same with emotion. They can measure the trail left by the thought or the trail left by the emotion. But the emotion itself is not in the physical world. Inside of the physical body is the energetic body that gives it life. This energetic body is called the body of chi, or the, bi the vital body, or the ethereal body. Or in Tibetan Buddhism, it's called the subtle body. This is a body of energy. Without the body of energy, there is, can be no physical body. The physical body is Malkut. The body of energy is Yasab, the ninth 
fear. The ninth sephira. This ninth sphere or vital body is within the physical body. It is the electricity of the physical body, the energy, the force of life, the prana, the aura. Without this body of energy, the physical body is dead. They're really two parts of one thing. They cannot be separated. If they are separated, the physical body dies. When we relate these two to the skandhas, we see that rupa is form. And the vital body or ethereal body is related to vedana, which is sensation. When some impression hits your physical body, you pick up something cold, there's an interaction that occurs between two forms of rupa, or form. And that crossing is a crossing of energy transmitted through the form. That crossing of energy is transmitted through the nervous system, which is intimately related with the vital body, the ethereal body. And that's how we receive sensations, through nerves. But once more, if the body, if the vital body is separated away, if the vital body is cut and taken from the physical body, those nerves can function, but no sensation is felt. Because those sensations are carried through the vital body. The vital body or ethereal body is the fourth dimension. It's related to Eden. And the fourth dimension is this body or this level of nature where these energies are, tr are processed and transformed. In the vital body, the ethereal body, this is a body of energy which has form. It has matter in the fourth dimension. And in its third dimensional aspect, it is the energy in the physical body. And this is something important to understand. These dimensions coexist. They interpenetrate each other. They're coexistent. As I'm standing here and giving this talk, you see my physical body. But what's animating my physical body are levels and levels of more and more subtle energy and matter. And the same is with you listening. Your physical body is there, but inside the physical body are processes that are happening related to the vital body. Energy in movement. And that vital body has its presence physically, but it's rooted in the fourth dimension. The vital body is made of four primary levels, or four sheaths. If we relate this to a form of physical matter, we could say that the... Uh, vital body would almost be like four gases of varying densities that make up that gaseous or ethereal body. And those are the ether of life and the chemical ether, which are related with biological processes. Those two ethers are responsible for our power of reproduction and the powers we have of metabolism, and transformations of energy in the body. The other two ethers that constitute the vital body are called luminous and reflecting. And these are the two superior parts. And these two are related with our powers of perception. Luminous and reflecting. These are ethers that transmit, receive, and transform the energies of sensation to and from our nervous system. This is why we can see that our vital body, called Yasod in Kabbalah, is synonymous with Vedana from Sanskrit, related with sensation. Going a little bit deeper, when we experience an emotion or a thought, emotions in the Kabbalah are characterized by hod, 
which is the eighth sphere from the top down. Hod is Hebrew for glory. And Hod is related with our astral body, the body of the stars. And in Sanskrit, this body can also be called Kama Rupa, which is the body of desire. Desire body. This becomes very important for us. When we begin to apply this analysis to discover the nature of our own I, our own self, we need to start to discriminate what we feel, the emotions that drive us. And we're really sincere with ourselves, really honest with ourselves. We can begin to see that the vast majority of what we feel as emotion is based in desire, selfish desire. This is why the astral body is called the body of desire or the emotional body. The seventh sphere on the tree of life is called Netzach, which means victory. And Netzach is related with the mental body. And this is, of course, our body of thought. When we have our process of thinking and thinking, it's related to the energy emanating from our own mental body. The astral and mental bodies interpenetrate one another. And they are within the vital or etheric body, which is within the physical body. And all of us are experiencing this right now. We have a physical body, which may be digesting something, which is processing our blood, which is receiving and transmitting signals of energy related to sensations coming through our perceptions. And we are also simultaneously feeling and experiencing emotions and thoughts. The vital and mental bodies are related with the fifth dimension, more subtle than the ethereal body. And of course, they are related with the third and fourth skandhas, samnya and samskara. Within these four bodies, we are a consciousness. In Kabbalah, these first four skandhas, the first four bodies we've described, are called the four bodies of sin. And this is because it is here that we act and make mistakes and make karma. Through our physical body, we express the energies that we receive through the ethereal body, the emotions that drive us, and the thoughts that we use to justify our desires. These four bodies of sin are also known as the protoplasmic bodies. And we say protoplasmic because they have a nature that is lunar, or mechanical. They are a form of inheritance that we receive from nature for free as a house or a vehicle through which our consciousness can acquire knowledge and experience. In all the great religions, there have been many explanations given about the process of our soul or our consciousness coming to inhabit physical matter. But we can say in concise terms that we come here because of karmic causes. Simply causes that we ourselves produced in the past. We have the body that we have now. We have the emotions that we have now. We have the thoughts that we have because we ourselves have made them. We have made our own house. And we suffer in it 
because we don't understand how we made it. And this is what we need to change. This Kabbalistic approach leads us to develop something very important, which is the ability to perceive directly each level of our own psyche. We know, of course, that we emphasize always the need to work here physically, to awaken the consciousness here and now in the physical body. And when we engage in that activity, to, from moment to moment, always be making the effort to see the truth of our perceptions, to see the truth of the sensations we experience, and to see the truth of our feelings and thoughts. Gradually, what we're doing is we're developing discrimination the ability to distinguish between the ego, the false I, and the real I. When people come to mystical studies of any kind, any religion, or any form of occult science or mysticism, it's always with the longing, to some level, to know what the real I is, the real self. In most religions, this is called God. In some religions, the idea of God is refuted. Like in Buddhism, for example, many people say that Buddhism says there is no God. But that's not exactly right. The Gnostic, in their investigative analysis of their own experience from moment to moment, is always looking to find what is real and what is not. If in the physical world we're making the effort to perceive and to be cognizant of ourselves, then we are making the effort to say, is this form permanent? Does it truly exist? Is it truly reliable? Is it truly what it appears to be? Is this sensation truly what it appears to be? Is it truly real? Is it dependable? And so on with perceptions and mental thoughts and feelings. In each case, what we're looking for is, does it have truth? Truth cannot be known by the eye. And this is something you'll never understand so long as you're still inside an eye. The truth cannot be known by the eye, by the mind. Only the consciousness can know the truth. But for that, the consciousness has to be extracted from the eye. This kind of self-analysis obviously begins here in the physical body by questioning and becoming aware of all the processes of the physical body. But I want to remind you, what we're looking at now is the deeper level of the skandhas. We have to open up our understanding of these skandhas, that they have multiple levels of meaning. When we're inside the physical body, we can see the other skandhas if we're very watching, if we're really watching and paying attention. We can see in the physical body sensations, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness if we're really becoming cognizant. But this isn't enough. We have to go beyond the physical body. You may observe yourself during the day and discover that you became very identified 
with a given moment in the day. Let's say someone did something that made you angry, which happens all the time, right? And so you observe the forms, the physical forms related to that experience. And you observe the sensations that you experience as you perceive those sensations. And then you can see how those perceptions were interpreted by the mental formations. In other words, by samskaras in the mind. And then you can see how your consciousness responds, reacts. When you're identified, the consciousness is asleep and responds mechanically according to its conditioning. And you can see all this physically. But if you want to destroy that mental formation, if you really want to come to know your true identity, your true self, you can't do it within that anger. Because that anger can only see through itself. That anger will always see everything from its point of view. In other words, if you're trying to comprehend that I while still being angry, you will not be able to do it. You may be able to understand a certain degree and experience a certain degree of what that anger feels like and what it looks like, but you won't be able to completely understand it and subsequently remove it. And that's because, simply, that mental formation of anger perceives all sensation according to its manufacturing. In other words, that samskara is also rupa, but in the mind. This is where this gets tricky. And this is where the limit of the intellect is. This is the value of meditation and dream yoga. If you begin to take these studies very seriously, to seriously observe yourself and to watch something in your psyche, you might have a dream or a conscious experience in meditation or dreaming where you see some person or persons who you don't recognize but who are doing you harm in some way, usually through intimidation, through violence, through threats, or through some form of enticement. And that person or persons is your own ego that you perceive in the fifth dimension, in your own subconsciousness. And in that level, those dream figures or images that you see in meditation have form. They have rupa. They experience sensation. They perceive. They are mental formations. And they trap consciousness inside of them that you need to bring out. So the experience of seeing your own ego, seeing these mental formations in yourself can be disturbing. You can see crowds. You can see a whole psychological city, which is yourself, your many selves. And that's why we call this the doctrine of the many. The legion of the I. In general, we talk about the ego as having three main components or three main sides. And these are the three traitors. And you find in all the different traditions that the great avatars and prophets always have three traitors. These three traitors are related with our three brains. The intellect, emotion, and motive instinctive sexual brain. And it's through these three brains 
that the seven capital sins manifest themselves. Those seven are actually innumerable variations, each one of which is a samskara, a mental formation or an ego, all of which are individual eyes or egos. And every ego, every eye, has a form, has sensations related to it, has perceptions related to it, and is its own samskara. There are 49 levels in our own mind. The mind is very deep. That mind is illustrated in what in religions are usually called hell. The Averno, the the Avernus, the Inferno, Avicii. Or in Kabbalah it's called Klipot. The world of the shells. A shell is a samskara. It is a vessel that in itself is empty of real existence. It's a shell with nothing of truth inside. Yet it traps consciousness. When the consciousness is extracted, the shell is revealed to be dust. Nothing but dust. The existence of the ego is only possible because we ourselves put our consciousness in it. We are the only ones responsible for that. When we, from moment to moment, begin to take responsibility for that, to analyze our experiences through our sensations and perceptions, through our thoughts and feelings, to become more cognizant of ourselves from moment to moment. We start to penetrate, to really become discriminating, to start to question the things that we feel and think, to look for the truth in any given thought or feeling or sensation, to not just be mechanical. Most of the time, we just do whatever we feel like. We just follow our thoughts, and we don't question them. When we start thinking, oh, this person must hate me, we just believe it. Or, oh, God hates me, we just believe it. We don't realize that this is an ego who's trying to corrupt us. We don't realize that that continual stream of thought and emotion is produced by lies. By self-produced illusion. The cage that we exist in, we made with our own hands because we became identified with form, with sensation, with perception and in turn created the ego. Self-observation initiates the process of developing a continuity of consciousness. You can never comprehend any religion unless you begin to work here and now on yourself to be cognizant, to be actively perceiving and discriminating phenomena. It doesn't matter what you call your religion. Without this active perception you remain like a leaf tossed by the wind. Tossed about by your own thoughts and feelings and by karma and by circumstances with no power. The power that we have is in the consciousness. That was the power we used to create the ego. That same power can be used to destroy it. The power is in our hands. It's not outside. It's in us. When we use that, through self-observation and self-remembering, that continuity of cognizance can be deepened and must be deepened 
by learning how to meditate. Meditation and self-observation are one and the same thing. They're the same activity. The activation of consciousness to be awake, to watch without distraction, to perceive actively, to receive all impressions from every possible direction with complete cognizance of that. We have that ability, but we don't develop it. When we do, our perceptions of these skandhas will change radically. We start to develop the ability to penetrate into things, to see beyond what we normally saw, to see deeper. And this is something intuitive. It's something spontaneous that can never be faked. And it's something beautiful. It's called realization. To realize is to see the inherent truth in something. We can begin to have realization now by looking into what has caused us to be caught in illusion. When we have a sense of self or an identity with a lot of consciousness trapped in it, when we begin to look into that and question that sense of self, we're looking to realize what is true in it and what is not. Some people are vegetarians. In itself, there's nothing wrong with this. Being a vegetarian is a very beautiful ideal with many benefits. But some people make an eye out of it. They make a religion out of the kitchen. They make a sense of self out of being a vegetarian. And because of this sense of I, they can become enraged at other people, angry. They can become proud, envious, jealous, fearful. In other words, they've trapped a huge amount of their own consciousness in that self, which in itself is a lie. The same is true of any of our tastes in our personality. Things that we become very much attached to are things that we have put our own consciousness into and trapped it there. In other words, we're giving away our inheritance. We're giving away our real power and putting it into a cage that will always lie. Through this discrimination, we begin to question that. We begin to not take that eye so seriously and question it, wonder about it, look deeper at it. Is it real? Is it true? Am I really that? In the morning when you put on those clothes, you put it on with this attraction towards a certain identity that you want to project. You want others to see you in a certain way because of the clothing that you picked or because of the hairstyle you picked, or the music you're playing in your car, or the kind of car you drive, or the place you're going to go hang out and have coffee. All of these we pick to project a sense of self. But if you begin to question that and say, is this really me? And think about it. Is my clothing really a definition of who I am? And then you begin to see that throughout your life you continually changed that clothing style? So where is your real self? Where is a real self in something that you continually alter and change? Where is something you can depend on, can rely on, even in the face of death? It's that penetrating investigation, that analysis, that can lead you to the realization that, that is not me. That projection that I'm trying to give to others, that I'm also trying to project to myself, is a lie. Why should I spend so much time and energy projecting a sense of self that doesn't even exist? That is false. This is how a Gnostic develops equilibrium. How they learn to stand on their own two feet to swim against the current of life, 
to follow the true self. The sense of identity which is based in truth, in reality, in direct realization of the facts. And I'm not talking about physical facts because everything physical is impermanent. When we take off those clothes at night, this is synonymous with us taking off the physical body when we die. And a night passes, and the next day we put on a new body. And we take on a new personality, maybe with a new gender, maybe in a different country, with a different language, with a different family. Where is the sense of self? Where is the I? This is the value of meditation, of dream yoga, of astral projection. When you really have that first experience of realizing that you were somewhere else, someone else, completely contrary to everything you think you are now, you'll realize how asleep we are. It's a shocking experience, but a beautiful one. So many things become clarified. And this is an experience that we all can have if we make the effort to practice. Those realizations of truth accumulate. The more practice we do, the more effort we make, we begin to penetrate more and more into all those different facets of our life to realize the essential nature of them. And what we begin to discover is that there is no I in the form. This physical body, there's no I there that's independent, that exists eternally. No I that's reliable. The physical body or the form of anything will die. There's no sense of self to be found in sensations. Because we discover that the antithesis is always there. If you really dive in to try to experience as much pleasurable sensation as possible, you initiate a swing of a pendulum, which is energetic, which is a law of nature called invariance. When that pendulum swings into the pleasurable side, it inevitably will swing all the way back to the other side because it has to equilibrate itself. And when you discover that, you realize, wait a minute, all this pain that I've been having, all the suffering I've been having, is because I was chasing after the illusion of pleasure. And when you realize that pendulum, you realize there is no I, there's no truth, there's no sense of self that's real in sensations. And you go deeper into perceptions and see that they are all illusory too. And that the way we perceive things is always modified. It's never real. So long as we're inside of that sense of self. And when you get into the level of seeing directly your own samskaras, investigating them in the internal worlds, in your dreams, in meditation, you discover the same thing. These are all senses of self that fight to dominate the consciousness. None of which are real. And none of them have God within. Then we arrive to the consciousness. This is an interesting experience. Arriving to the direct experience of the consciousness. The first part, as an aggregate, vijnana, consciousness, is trapped in all the samskaras. So it is compartmentalized, fragmented, dispersed through the mind. In this way, when we enter in and experience those little sections, those little particles... There's beauty in those portions of consciousness, but they aren't the consciousness free or as a whole. And it's here that some traditions have become misled. Believing that as soon as you can taste samadhi, you've found liberation. Some traditions teach that by learning how to access samadhi, and experience those sparks of freedom, that's liberation. All you have to do is extend those experiences. This is a lie. 
that consciousness is still trapped in the ego. And what happens to those followers of those groups, they develop mystical pride. Mythomania. A belief in a divine eye or a superior eye. They begin to call themselves masters, avatars, prophets, guides proclaiming themselves to be this or that incarnated master or great initiate from past ages. They may experience samadhis, but filtered in a very subtle way. This is why the Buddha, when he taught the samskaras, or taught about the skandhas, rather, he taught the doctrine of anatman, We study Atman in Hinduism and in Gnosis. And Atman is related to Chesed, the fourth sphere. Atman is our own spirit, our own Buddha, our inner father, our inner God. A practitioner who is developing the discrimination to move beyond the superficial levels of the ego and to look deeper to have the experience of the consciousness may experience the beauty, the glory of their own Atman, their own spirit. But then they become identified and believe that is the real self. But it's not. The Buddha taught the doctrine of anatman, no self. The Buddha did not deny the existence of the soul or the existence of the self or the spirit. What the Buddha denied was that the spirit can exist independently. The Buddha taught that the soul cannot exist independently that the self cannot exist independently, that everything in manifestation is dependent upon its origin. For the serious Gnostic, the person who goes beyond the physical form in Malkut, the fourth dimension, the fifth dimension, and is penetrating the experience of the sixth dimension Vijnana, consciousness, related to the sphere of Tiferet. In that sphere is the causal world. And the experience we have there is completely without ego. There is no ego there. There's only consciousness and beyond consciousness. But when those experiences are brought back to the physical brain, they pass through the skandhas through the mental formations, through our perceptions, and are interpreted as sensations manifesting in form, through the brain. Thus, our astral experiences, our out-of-body experiences, are translated by the eye. And so we remember, I was in such and such a great level of consciousness the sixth or seventh dimension, and I saw my inner God, and I am the incarnation of so-and-so. This is how mythomania begins. The soul, trapped in the ego, is seduced into believing it is a saint. Master Samuel on Vior was very explicit throughout his books that we have to go beyond the consciousness. In many of his books, he taught a practice which is rarely understood, which you may have read, a practice where he says, first we lie down to meditate, we empty the mind of all thought. Of course, most of us can't do that, but we skip ahead to the next step anyway. Then he says, first we abandon the physical body. We look at the physical body, we examine the physical body, and we say, I am not the physical body, and we leave it. Then we examine the ethereal body, 
and we examine that body and we look at that body and we discriminate that body and then we say, I am not the ethereal body and we abandon it. And we go likewise, consecutively, through the astral body, through the mental body, through the causal body, through the body of the consciousness and through the body of the spirit, the atomic body. And in each case, the procedure is the same. We examine that body and we abandon it. This practice is not understood because very few of us have developed the capacity, firstly, to directly perceive even our own physical body. Most of us are so identified with the physical body, we equate it with ourselves, with the sense of self. We've not yet developed the capacity to see the physical body is impermanent and it is not the self then we have to develop the capacity to see and examine consciously, directly, the ethereal body. To examine it consciously and then to discard it. This is a whole other level. And then we have to go likewise through the fifth and sixth dimensions, examining all these other bodies to see, this is not myself. This is not myself. And this is not myself. The ultimate experience of this practice is to come to the direct realization of the doctrine of anatman, the doctrine of no self. To be free of vehicles of any kind. To be something that is and is not. Something that you can experience but can never explain. something that is universal and divine, that has a sense of self. It has a sense of self. It has real identity. It has real individuality. But it is not an I. In Buddhism, they call this shunyata. This is the experience of the emptiness. And it's not emptiness in the way we think of it as something that lacks existence. It lacks inherent existence, but it does exist. It lacks a sense of I, but it is an I. It is a divine form of individuality that is beyond individuality. It is, in a sense, the body of Christ. The experience of the trikayas and beyond that, This is where we begin to discover the nature of the real self. Some students, when they study this doctrine, become very confused and say, I don't understand a teaching that says that you have to kill the entire ego and kill the personality. What's left? Do we become nothing? And it's easy to understand this question because all we know is the ego. All we know is the personality. We don't understand there's something beyond that. The truth is, there is. There is an experience beyond ego and beyond personality, but it's unlike anything that the intellect can conceive of. It's a, it's a kind of perception and experience that is more real than physical reality. It is more real than the astral world or the mental world. It is more real than the causal world. It is reality. It is something beyond what we can conceive in the mind. And from that place have come our most beautiful human beings, Jesus and Buddha, Krishna and Moses and Quetzalcoatl, Muhammad. These are all great, great beings who have come from this place as individuals, real individuals, to teach us how to come to real individuality. But for that, the false I has to die. This is how we come to know the real I. We have to escape the false one 
The false one has to die. When the false eye is dead, what remains is happiness. Love. Do you have any questions? I'm not sure I entirely understand your question. Um, in, in other words, uh, let's say that my, um, my father died. Mm-hmm. And I'm crying, or I'll never see my father again, alive, this, that, and the other. Is that uh, some sort of identification because we don't you know, grasp the concept that the physical body was not him, but rather mm-hmm. um, the true self was housed within that physical body? Right. Yeah, the, the mourning we feel for someone who's died is precisely that identification and, but that identification is multifaceted. The first is what you stated, that we're identified with the physical form of that person. But why? Why are we identified with the physical body of our loved ones? And why do we think that is their self? It's because we think that of ourselves. When you have the experience that your real self is beyond the physical body, then you begin to comprehend that that's true for everyone. And then you begin to comprehend that when someone dies, your experience of that doesn't need to be what it used to be. You can be different. The identification that we have with each other is really harmful. And when someone dies, for example, when you're very identified with them, crying and mourning for that person, In some sense, it can provide solace, like a sense of uh, comfort for that dead person, but it also becomes a source of attachment. And so it can limit them. It can stop them from going on, moving on to what they need to do. And there are cases where uh, someone was grieving so much for a dead relative that the dead relative remained behind. The personality or the, the essence of that person couldn't go on because the attachment is so strong. The better thing for us to do is to pray for them and to encourage them to aspire towards the light. And there's a a great deal of instruction about that in the texts related to the Tibetan Book of the Dead that are very practical and can be used by anyone. Any other questions? The practice of meditation in itself is quite simple. The goal of meditation is to activate the consciousness so that it develops the ability to um, perceive reality, right? To realize the truth. And we have to start where we are. We begin meditation right here where we are in our physical bodies. So when we sit to meditate, we start by relaxing the three brains slowly and carefully. Right? First, you have to relax the body completely. You have to relax your mind completely, but also your mood, your emotions. And when those things become relaxed, then you can start to concentrate and extract consciousness, pull back from all external phenomena. But here's where some additional difficulty can come in. First, many people can't even relax. Even some that call themselves advanced meditators or people who've been meditating for 10, 20 years, they really don't relax properly. And so the result is they wind up sitting there for half an hour or an hour, but never really reaching meditation 
because there's some vibration in the body or in one of the three brains that traps the consciousness there in that level. Someone who has actually relaxed and has combined drowsiness with attentiveness then begins to become more introverted and forgets the physical body. Forgets it. May still be aware of it, but is no longer grasping to it. And this state is similar to what we feel when we fall asleep. We start to feel the body is different, that we are not the body. This is an important feeling. When that separation is beginning to deepen, then we have other techniques that we apply, like watching the breath, or the techniques like labeling, or uh, Mahamudra, ways of analyze, analyzing. I'm sorry, not Mahamudra, but um, uh, Vipassana. In those experiences or those practices, the goal there is to deepen that sense of separation. It's not to simply sit there and label things or keep noting, right? So it's true, people get stuck. Just in the same way that people can become stuck counting or, or watching the breath with anapana practices, where you're observing the flow of the breath in and out, some people just get stuck there. They go right to that spot and they stay there. That's fine, but they won't actually meditate. And likewise, people who begin to observe thoughts and feelings and sensations and note them or become more cognizant of them can also become stuck in that place. And this is also okay, but it's still not meditation. Meditation begins when the absolute quietude erupts, when the mind goes completely silent. This is where we reach dhyana, which is a state of almost like, we, some people call it the void. It's not the void. It's just a still mind. In that state becomes the first possibility to actually meditate on something, which is dharana. And this is the ability to concentrate on one thing without any distraction. One-pointed mind, or shamatha, which we talk about in Tibetan Buddhism a lot. And shamatha also has levels. But this experience of undivided attention is also not meditation. It's concentration. When we talk about meditation, what we really are indicating is samadhi. Samadhi is different. And the experience of each of these things will tell you exactly what I'm describing. Concentrating on one thing to the exclusion of everything else is a good practice and can be used as a doorway to samadhi, but it is not samadhi. Likewise, non-exclusive meditation, which is like a Mahamudra technique, is a type of meditation on meditation. It's a, it's a way of, it's called the methodless method, and it's a way of developing attention and awareness without using a particular fo form of focus. That too can lead to samadhi, but in itself is not. Samadhi is that doorway that we go through when the consciousness completely escapes the three brains. It completely leaves behind all of the skandhas. And there's an experience of ecstasy. And that experience can be an instant or it can last what seems like days. So the key important factor through all of these degrees or all of these possible experiences from being in the physical body to walking through the door of samadhi is detachment. Detachment. In this instant, we are attached, identified with being in the body, with sensations, with perceptions, with mental formations, even with consciousness that's trapped. When we sit to meditate, the whole purpose is to start detaching, to not identify with anything. And we start with the three brains. We relax the body 
to not identify with the body. We relax the thoughts to not identify with the thoughts. We relax our feelings so we don't identify with them. And then when things surge, the reason we note them and we, ident- we look at them is to separate ourselves, to not identify. Follow me? This is called psychological judo. It's where we turn each sensation and experience back against itself to push them back. And this is how that space of serenity opens up inside. And in that space is complete non-identification. Just serenity. Pure perception. Cognitive. Right? Cognizant. But beyond thought. In any stage of that process of trying to approach the door of samadhi, we can become identified. That may be with a pain in our leg. It may be with an itch. It may be with being tired. It may be with the desire for samadhi. This is a huge obstacle. The desire to escape the body, the desire to talk to an angel or a master can become an obstacle. The desire to impress, to look like we know how to meditate. This is an obstacle. In each case, we have to extract the consciousness to not identify. This is not an easy thing. What it requires is becoming attentive. right? So the whole purpose of the, of the naming or labeling and looking at those things is to pull back. We get pulled back into sensation, perception, mental formation, or form because we become identified. The reason we lose the samadhi is because we become identified. You need, when we do walk through that door of samadhi, and we have some experience, normally, the very first time it happens, we become so excited that it ends immediately and we're back in the body. And then we feel that mixture of excitement and disappointment. And we become really identified with that. And then we can't get the experience again. For a long time. <laughs> this happens all the time. I'm not laughing because, well, anyway, it happens to me, so I, that's why I'm laughing. So it takes a lot of psychological equilibrium to have those experiences and not become identified with them. And let me give you the first, most critical, important clue. Don't talk about it. Do not. That urge to talk about it will get you identified so fast and then you'll be stuck again and not able to have those experiences again. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I understand, yeah. When I say not talk about it, I'm referring primarily to the cognizant or conscious experiences that we have, to our realizations. Even if that realization is physical, even if we realize that the body is impermanent and that we are impermanent, in a lot of cases, we want to talk about it in situations that aren't appropriate, where someone else can't understand us. And so we'll wind up creating a problem. Or we'll build our own pride. We'll just build too much pride. I'm not saying that you should not talk about your feelings or how you feel about things. There is value in the sangha, in the community, in relating with each other and and supporting with each other and discussing. This is an important part of having a spiritual community and having a family as well. But you have to learn to discriminate there too. To learn to listen to how your real self will guide you through intuition. And that's something that I'd hope to address in the lecture today, which is part of discrimination is learning how to discriminate the impulses that we feel in our actions. Part of the reason we need to always be watching our three brains is to discriminate those impulses. We feel impulses to act in certain ways. We feel impulses to feel in certain ways or to think in certain ways. 
But we need to question them all, to discriminate them, to learn the flavor. And there's a distinct difference between impulses that come from our real being and impulses that come from the ego. But sometimes that flavor is very subtle. And that takes experience. There's no other solution for that but experience. There was another question back here. Any spiritual studies are appropriate related to the subject of today. Um, in particular, I'd recommend that you read, firstly, the, the works of Samael and Vior, because all of this is synthesized in his work. If you meditate on what you read, you will come to understand that. Sometimes uh, what we do for lectures is we take a given section of his work and we expand on it, and we illustrate it using examples from the traditions that we draw from. This is an example of that. The teaching of the skandhas is universally taught in Buddhism and was well understood by Samalayam Vyor, but he synthesized it by simply saying aggregates, the psychological aggregates. And most of us read that and just think he means the egos. But we have to go deeper. What does that mean? What is an ego and how does it work? And when you investigate into Buddhism itself, you'll find it, Buddhism teaches these five skandhas. And some students have become confused, not able to see the relationship between skandhas as traditionally taught and aggregates as taught in Gnosticism. And my hope was in these two lectures to explain the relationship. For me, it's clear. It's deep. There's a lot of depth to it. And we could have gone a lot deeper. But in reality, there's something we have to acquire for ourselves. Outside of the works of the Master and Buddhism, uh, I would refer you to all the great scriptures because this knowledge is within all of them. Another question? Um, so how do we avoid getting stuck on the dress or on labeling? The question is about how to not get stuck on the breath or labeling. Well, don't do the practice. If you feel you're getting stuck labeling, don't do it. If you feel you're being stuck on labeling the, or naming the breath, then don't do that. Pull back from that. Look at things a little bit differently. The whole exercise of meditation is an exercise of consciousness. It is not mechanical. Some people in Hinduism especially, and in some cases in Buddhism, have the very mistaken idea that, for example, if you repeat this mantra 100,000 times, then you will reach somebody. And there are a lot of teachers who teach that way. And this is false. There is no mechanical way to activate consciousness. It's done by will and by using it and learning how it works. And you learn how it works by working with it. If you just sit to meditate and you enter into a mechanical, repetitive practice, you're not going anywhere. Whatever the practice is makes no difference. If you're doing it mechanically and repetitively, all you're doing is you're like sitting on a solitary bicycle spinning the wheels around. But you're not going anyplace. On the other hand, any practice from this tradition can awaken your consciousness if you use it consciously. The practice that I described earlier, that Master Samael taught, of identifying, of analyzing each body and gradually extracting ourselves from it, you can use that now. That practice, to just start looking closely at the physical body, can lead you straight to samadhi, even the first time you use it, if you do it consciously, cognizantly. This is the whole point. You can access samadhi without any technique if you know how to do it. And you can teach yourself. But it's hard to teach yourself. And that's why we use the books and scriptures and practices. Each one teaches us details that we learn. But there is no mechanical way. So watch yourself very carefully. When you see yourself becoming mechanical and repetitive, 
change what you're doing. Change it. It doesn't have to be a big dramatic change. Just become conscious. Do it cognizantly. Any other questions? Just say that sound, the sounds around, especially in meditation, is a big obstacle, right? But to treat sound as music, like you listen to music, right, is a big help, you know, as noise. Well, you know, your point is very good. What you stated was that um, sounds around us when we meditate it can be obstacles. What is the truth is, anything can be an obstacle. But at the same time, anything can be a support, can help us. When you study Tantra, if you study any traditional writings of Tantra, the, the Tantras themselves, one of the main things that is emphasized, particularly in the higher schools, is that the Tantric practitioner learns to take advantage of everything and to turn it to his advantage and to use it. Now, to some, this sounds really dangerous. And some people do use it in the wrong way and turn that into black magic. But as an example, let's say you're meditating and there's a jackhammer next door. Most of us would be really irritated by that. And so most of us would just stop be frustrated, and give up. Some people will use it as a mantra and begin to meditate in that sound and use that sound. And also, going deeper than that, some people will use their frustration. If you really have the experience of getting frustrated and you begin to look into that frustration and meditate in that, there's a doorway to samadhi there because in that anger is consciousness. And when you can connect to that, you can connect right into the heart of that anger and see what caused it, what it's made of, where it came from. You can comprehend it. You can realize it. You can destroy it. Most of us don't do that. Most of the time we just get frustrated, walk away. Any other questions? Right. Yeah, yeah. This is a big problem. It's very prevalent in many schools of mysticism. And that is, when any kind of experience arises, the person will label that and think that they've understood it. As an example, if the jackhammer goes off and we become frustrated and angry, the person thinks, oh, that's anger. That's anger, that's anger, that's anger. That's my anger. Okay, I've seen my anger. Now I know I have anger. Good, I have anger. And that's it. And they don't go any further and they think they've comprehended something. This is not comprehension. This is labeling. To comprehend the anger is to penetrate into that anger and to see when you made it, how you made it, how it acts, how it behaves, how it feeds itself, how it manipulates you, what it uses, How does it control you? How does it manipulate your three brains? Where did it come from? What body did you create it in? What lifetime did you create it in? How long has it been there? How big is it? How fat is it? How much energy is it taking from you every day? When you can understand those things, then you've comprehended it. But more than that, you've really comprehended it when you're not angry anymore. When that jackhammer goes off and you feel no anger then the ego is not there. Any other questions? Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. 
Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,